All right, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 um, and stand with me if you are able for the reading of God's Word. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we ought to give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord. Because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. And obey our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good word and word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but God's word stands forever. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would be here in this place. Lord, that you would comfort our hearts. Lord, as we study and look and read things that are not comforting, or as we find ourselves in hospitals like Debbie and Dale are, Lord, would you comfort us? Would you show what your word has to teach us? And Lord, we, we lift up our, our sister in Christ, Debbie. We pray that you would heal her, that you would be with her. We pray for, for answers and for wisdom for the doctors. And Lord, we, we pray that you would do your magnificent work. And we pray here in this place, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our ears, that we would hear your word and what it is you have to show us this morning, that we can stand firm even at the end of the world. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. You can be seated. So this morning, um, we are going to talk a lot about the Antichrist. Um, now, this is a figure that's gotten a lot of attention throughout history. Uh, it's led to some obsession, some bad movies, and plenty of pointing figures at different politicians and trying to figure out who is the Antichrist. Uh, but even with some of this foolishness, we need to recognize that the Antichrist is a very real figure, and one day he will come. And though the word um, Antichrist is never used in this passage, this passage really is all about this figure. Now, the Antichrist is not really Satan himself, but he's kind of the anti-version of Jesus, where Christ really was God incarnate, the second person of the Trinity, fully God and fully man. The Antichrist is kind of a pretend counterfeit version of Satan incarnate and a human being. And so what we need to do as we study this is we really need to think clearly and biblically, right, about what do we need to know about the Antichrist and the return of Jesus. And so what do we need to know? Well, Paul actually tells us um, everything that he thinks we need to know about the Antichrist in the second chapter of Thessalonians. Now, you'll notice he doesn't tell you everything that you want to know. He doesn't tell you everything you wish that you would know. He won't answer all of your questions. You'll probably still have some questions after today's over. But Paul does give us everything that we need to know. 
And so we're going to look at this chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to talk about when the Antichrist is going to come, how much power he's going to have, and how to resist him. So we'll talk about when he's coming, what kind of power does he have, and how do we resist. So our first point, if you're taking notes, when is he going to come? Well, the Antichrist will come before Christ returns. So the Antichrist will come before Christ returns. You can't really understand the Antichrist unless you're studying Christ as well. And you shouldn't. Um, you really shouldn't study anything in theology without going to Jesus too to see, well, how does Jesus impact this or change this? How does it connect to him? And the appearance of the Antichrist here is tied directly to the second coming of Jesus. In verse 1, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, So he makes it clear here what he's doing is he's addressing the question, well, when is Jesus returning? When is he coming back? When is he setting up his kingdom and defeating all of our enemies? And so Paul talks about the Antichrist in order to answer that question. And when our Christ, the King Jesus, returns, all believers, we will be gathered together with him. Now, this word for gathering, it's only used one other place in the New Testament. That's in Hebrews 10, 25, and it's used to describe the command that we are not to neglect the weekly gathering, as is the habit of some. So it is this gathering that we find ourselves here doing this morning. And what Paul is describing, the assembly of the church, but he's saying, hey, on that day when Jesus returns, we're going to have one big gathering. The uniting of not just every church in Duncan and Marlowe and Comanche, but every single church on the globe. We will all be gathered together with our king. It will be the first time that the true church gathers together for worship. What a day that's going to be. And so Paul's writing to think, hey, don't think you missed it. That day hasn't come yet. We're still waiting. Verse 2, we ask you, brothers and sisters, don't be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or spoken word or a letter, seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. He does not want us to be quickly shaken or alarmed. Paul doesn't want us to be filled with fear or to be terrified about the end times or eschatology. And this same caution, it's used two other times. Jesus himself says it in the New Testament. Both of them, they're in the Olivet Discourse. It's in Matthew 24, 6 and Mark 13, 7. Jesus tells believers, hey, don't be alarmed. Don't be shaken. Even when you see wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes, don't be alarmed. Don't be. Even when the world is falling apart, you don't have to worry. I don't think that Jesus isn't going to come. What we need to do is we need to remember, hey, if studying the end times, if studying things like the Antichrist is alarming you and making you nervous and terrified, you're not doing it right. Okay, you you need to study better. Maybe you need to get a new teacher because it's studying it. It should bring us great comfort, like Paul prays at the end of the chapter. It seems like for them, some seem to have been teaching that Jesus already came. Or maybe they've even been impersonating Paul's letters, which is why he says, you know, some are telling you by a spoken word or a letter seeming to be coming from us. They're trying to distort his teaching. That's why he says in verse 2, he mentions that. And some either by the Spirit. Some seem to be claiming to prophesy, hey, Jesus returned, he's here, he's back. And Paul's saying, hey, don't listen to them. He's also saying, don't worry, even if the world seems to be getting worse or everything's falling apart. Why? Verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way. He doesn't want them to be deceived by false teaching. And there's plenty of deception and false teaching that happens, especially in this area of eschatology. Right? And, I, and I don't mean just places where Christians disagree and there's different valid biblical interpretations. I mean places where people are saying things like, hey, Y2K, Jesus is coming back, be ready. Or if, you know, some of you remember that, there are people who were saying that then, right? But we need to be wary. We have to use discernment in every area of theology, but especially here, because there's a lot of false teachers out there. And really, I, I think if somebody's telling you and they're setting dates on when they know Jesus is coming back, or they're telling you they figured it out, this person's the Antichrist, uh, probably be wary. Generally speaking, you should just avoid that person. They're, they're not, they're deceiving you. Now, in order to help us from being deceived, Paul gives us some guidance. He describes two things that have to happen before Jesus will return. Verse 3, he says, For that day, so the day Christ returns, will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So before Jesus returns, there's two key events, it seems, that have to happen. This is why he says, well, before that day comes. The first thing that needs to happen before his return is the rebellion comes first. 
Now, that word for rebellion, it's actually the Greek word apostasia or apostasy, right? So your translation, it may say the apostasy comes first, which is, you know, can help you be a little clearer. Well, what kind of rebellion do you mean? And I think this appears to be describing the church. The church is those who are going to commit apostasy or at least some in it. Now, there are some who will disagree with me there. They might try and identify it as someone else committing this rebellion or apostasy. Um, but I think it's the church because there's only, not all of the church, but it's really only Christians who have faith who can then, you know, apostatize and deny that faith. You can't really apostatize if you don't have faith in the first place. So before Christ returns, it seems that there will be large amounts of Christians, people who profane faith in Jesus, at least claim it, probably don't actually have it, will commit apostasy and turn their backs on the truth. They will abandon the faith. So that event has to happen. And the other event is the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So now the Antichrist steps onto the stage. And so his revealing this apostasy, they're probably tied closely together. It doesn't necessarily mean the apostasy, then the Antichrist, they're probably going on at about the same time or related to each other. Uh, I think his appearance will probably lead to that. But it appears both of these need to take place before Jesus returns. Now, you may have noticed, if you haven't already, I haven't mentioned the rapture yet. Um, that's, that's on purpose. Um, now, now, personally, this is, this is me. You can, you're allowed to disagree with me, as always. Well, not always. There are some things you can't disagree with me on, like Jesus being God. You can't disagree with me on that. You need to find a different church. Um, but you can't disagree with me here. Um, now, my study of the scriptures and of theology has led me to believe I don't really um, believe that there is a rapture. I don't think there's a secret coming of Jesus before the second coming of him. I don't think there's two comings. I think there's just one. It's just when he returns again. And so the main reason I kind of keep circling back to that is I just can't see a distinction between the second coming of Jesus and another coming in his rapture before that. When I'm reading Thessalonians and reading his word, it seems like there's just one coming when he comes, and then everything happens there. Um, I, I think they're the same event. The gathering of the church up in the air, I think that's what's describing here, and I think that's going to happen when Jesus returns, and then we'll come back, and he'll set up and rule and reign. And I think that will happen after these events, after the apostasy, after the Antichrist, and after um, the tribulation. Now, I, I know I disagree with Pastor Brad here, uh, disagree with some of my professors at DTS, probably disagree with some of you, at least some of you in here, if not many of you. Um, but I do want you to know, okay, this isn't a weird theology position. I didn't just like invent this and make this up myself because I'm so smart. Um, it, it's actually, it's probably called like a post-tribulational view if you want a big fancy theological term. Um, there's a lot of goodly, godly Christians who agree with me. It's not like a weird minority view. There's plenty of good godly Christians who think I'm wrong too, like some of you, and that's okay. Um, but, so if you think there's a rapture, right, if you disagree with me here, and there are two, Jesus' his return is happening in two stages, we need to figure out how to interpret this passage as well. Okay, so you might take it to say that, well, maybe this apostasy happens and the Antichrist appears, but then the rapture is going to come and then will disappear. But it's not the full coming of Jesus yet. That would be one way to interpret it. Uh, but I think you'll run into a problem when you get to the timing of verse 8 with when that happens, because that's where Jesus comes the Antichrist dies, and it's, it's one coming we're talking about here. This is why, again, this is just me. I, I have a hard time distinguishing between them. Or you can just say more likely Paul is just focused on the second coming, and he's not really worried about the rapture at all. That's another way you could kind of um, interpret it. Now, I, I want to focus, the sermon's really not about the rapture, it's mostly about the Antichrist, but I needed to, to mention it in case you were wondering if that just led to confusion and many questions, pull me aside after service. I'm happy to explain more to you or come see me during the week. We can talk about it more. Um, but back to Second Thessalonians, so verse 3, it describes, so the man of lawlessness is revealed. Again, he's lawless. He doesn't care for the laws of God. And it's not just he doesn't like the Old Testament. He doesn't like the Mosaic law. It's that he doesn't like anything that God has to say. He is anti-God in every sense of the word. And so he is that. He's also called a son of destruction, which might make you think, well, he is one who is causing lots of destruction, which is true, but it actually means the son who is doomed for destruction. Jesus himself, he uses this title in John 17, 12 to describe Judas. When he says, well, you gave me all the disciples and I kept all of them, and I kept them safe, except for the son of destruction, the son doomed for destruction. So even in his name that God gives us, it should give us comfort. You can just think, oh, the Antichrist, that's the one who's doomed for destruction. That's his title because he's doomed. And the Antichrist, he opposes God in verse 4. 
He opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God and object of worship. So he does not just oppose the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He opposes everything and anyone who would be a God. All of the gods of Greek and Roman mythology, he's against them. Any God that any tribe has worshipped anywhere, any God of Buddhism or Hinduism, he's against those gods and he's against all gods. And he's against every false god and every idol and every object of worship. He doesn't want people to worship their phones or their addictions. He wants all the worship for himself. Nothing else. Him and him alone. And the rest of verse 4 describes how he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So there's a lot this could mean. It could mean that he, he quite literally does this. Um, There's plenty of disagreement in trying to figure out what exactly this means. Does this mean that the temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem? He causes the temple to be rebuilt, and then he goes and he sits in it. Could be a reference to the universal church, right? If lots of Christians have turned away, the church is often described as a temple in the new temple, and our bodies are temples um, throughout the New Testament. So he metaphorically does this. Could just be a metaphor describing his actions, could be he tries to go up into the heavens like in Revelation 17 and sit in the throne in the temple of God that is there. Um, the point here really is that he is daring to call himself God. Paul's focus is not so much on the location that we can you know, try and debate and figure out exactly where this is. But the main thing is he's trying to overthrow God and claim to be God himself. The point is the blasphemy, not really where the blasphemy occurs. The blasphemy is kind of the worst part here. Okay, the location is secondary. And then in verse 5, Paul says this. He says, don't you remember when I was with you, I told you these things? It's kind of a funny, almost backhanded, but probably very gentle remark from Paul. Where he's saying, guys, I already told you about this. I've already given you instructions about the Antichrist. And I don't think Paul is just giving them a reminder. I think he's telling them here, hey, I've told you everything you need to know, guys. You don't need to keep asking me questions. I, you know, you've got the answers that you need. And like us, the Thessalonians probably had lots of questions. One of the questions about the apostasy, about the Antichrist, the temple. Does this mean the temple is being built again? Is it not? When is he coming? Where will it be from? How can you recognize him? And Paul's saying, hey, don't you remember? You, I think he's saying they don't need to know more. And I think this is one of the key verses for us to grapple with here, that God has told us everything that we need to know. If we needed to know more, it would have been in His Word for us to find. If it's not, we must not need to know it yet or would have told us about it. And so we don't need to know more even though we want it. And so I I think instead of just asking God for more information, we should be content. should be content with what, you know, we know what we need to. And so to summarize, the first thing that we need to know is just we need to remember he's going to return before Jesus. Even if you hold to rapture, he's going to return before the second coming, before Jesus fully comes to rule and to reign. But so now let's look at the power that he has. Point number two in your bulletins is that the Antichrist has no power over Christ. The Antichrist has no power over Christ. It's the most important thing that you can know about him and his abilities. But right away in verse 6, we see Christ controls the Antichrist. And you know what is restraining him now, that he may be revealed in his time. The Antichrist wants to come now. Satan wishes that he could be revealed now, but there appears to be something holding him back. So I'm going to argue about what exactly is the identity of what is holding him back, because it's a little vague on what is restraining him. Is it an angel like in Daniel 10, the angel that struggles with Gabriel? Is it the church that we withstand him and then when we disappear, now he can come? Is it good gospel preaching that withholds the enemy in his work? Or is it the Roman Empire? That was what some, you know, church fathers thought. So some argue about this, but ultimately whatever you decide on and you think it is, God's the one behind it all. Ultimately, God is the one who is restraining the Antichrist from appearing. So God is almost holding him back like a dog on a leash. He wants to get out, but not until God lets go. Verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness, it's already at work. Only he who restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. So the enemy, he's working his own plan. So I put John in 1 John says, hey, there's already Antichrist among you. There's Antichrist kind of in every age working and God, they're trying and trying to get here, but God's holding them back. And so that's what it means by this mystery of lawlessness. The enemy's attempt now in this place, not just here, but really all over the world to destroy the church and to oppose Jesus. His plan's active. 
It's been active since Paul wrote this letter, but God restrains it and God frustrates it. And then he's playing, it's only going to move forward when Christ allows it. The Antichrist might have some power, but he doesn't have any power over Jesus. He's not stronger. He's not on equal footing. He's just a little yippy dog on a leash. Verse 8 is my favorite. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Okay, so now here he comes. Finally, the Antichrist, he's getting to come on stage. He gets to deliver his big monologue that he's been practicing. All the enemy's plans, they get to begin and go into motion. Finally, the plan maybe Satan's had since the beginning of the Garden of Eden, it shows up. The one's revealed, but look at the rest of the verse. Um, Whom the Lord will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing. It's kind of like that. The Antichrist is going to show up and be really excited and a train's going to come and it's going to drown him out and he'll be brought to nothing and disappear. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for that illustration. But Jesus is just going to walk up. He's going to kill the Antichrist with words. We're not going to have a big battle or a sword duel. All that buildup and frustration is brought to nothing. The real power is in the mouth of Christ. Not in the hands of the Antichrist. Paul wants to make it very clear. The power of the enemy is always subject to God's sovereign control. He resists God, but God is the one holding him back. And the Antichrist does have some power, but before Paul even tells you about it in verse 9, he wants you to know that God's is better and God's is bigger and God's really the one in control. So you don't hear about it and get scared. It's, hey, before you hear about it, he dies. Okay, now we can talk about him. But, you know, he dies at the end. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. So Satan is behind the Antichrist. He's going to come with all the power he has, and most of his power is in false signs and wonders. It's like a magician, an illusionist who's pretending to work some great magic, but when you look behind the curtain, it's just a trick of mechanics and engineering. It'll be like Pharaoh's magicians who tried to imitate Moses. It looks like power, but it's deceitful and false. I mean, it's like a big, fancy race car, but there's no engine inside. Verse 10, And with all the wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. But His power will, will fool the perishing. It's going to fool some. It's going to lead them away from the gospel. Those who have refused to accept the love of Jesus, the salvation that Christ offers, they're going to serve another Savior. Because ultimately, every bow, one bows down to a Christ. You can bow down to the Antichrist or you can bow down to Jesus Christ. You can bow down to the true Christ or you can bow down to the false one. When the false one appears, it's going to be made clear. But look at verse 11. Even the deceptions, it's not ultimately his own power. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. So God is actually the one who allows them to be deceived. The Antichrist doesn't have this great power of delusion. This even God does. You know, at the end of the day, God is the one with all of the power here. The end times, the apocalypse, the eschaton, Armageddon, the great war between heaven and hell, it's not really a struggle. God's in control the whole time. And the Antichrist only has power because God allows it. The Antichrist only has followers because God allows it. And Satan only gets to succeed when and how God allows it. You may wonder why God would allow people to be deceived. It sounds unfair. Maybe you think it seems like it's happening against their will. Well, look at verse 12. In order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. These are people who have had every chance to believe the truth. Should have known to repent of their sins and believe in Jesus. Instead, they've embraced lies. So you want to embrace lies and believe false things? God says, fine. Here's all the lies you could ever want. And so they're deceived again because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. They didn't love God, didn't enjoy God, don't want to worship God, don't want to obey God. They love sin and unrighteousness instead. And so God says, okay, you love sin, go have all the sin you want. I'll stop holding you back. So God's action here, it's not unfair, but it is justice. He's giving people exactly what they deserve. It doesn't make anyone do something against their will. He fulfills their desires, which are not good. The desires that want deception and sin, they get more of it. But even in this, we see the Antichrist has no power over Jesus. And this should encourage us. 
Okay, this should fill us with joy. We shouldn't have any cause to fear the Antichrist because our Christ is better. Too often, Christians can kind of approach the subject of the Antichrist with fear. We're afraid some world leader might be them over there. Or we're worried and scared. What if I'm in the, in the room with them? What kind of power and miracles will they wield and have? Okay, if we're studying this chapter, you should know there's no cause for shaking or alarm or terror or fear whatsoever. You can just relax and take a breath. And then it's not just that Jesus is going to win at the end. It's that Jesus is in control at every moment. Not one sparrow goes unnoticed by God. There's not one thing the Antichrist could do that God doesn't see. The Antichrist and Satan, it's almost like they have to fill out an application every time they have a plan. It's got to go and it's got to sit on God's desk. And then the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the God, the Father, the Trinity will discuss among themselves, okay, are we going to allow this or not? Everything the Antichrist does has to be allowed by God. So you have nothing to fear. Beloved, the Antichrist is going to die with a single word at the end in verse 8 and come to nothing. And God said, let there be light, and the world was created out of nothing. Those words, Jesus said, it is finished, and our sins were wiped away and forgiven on the cross. And one day, Jesus can just say, enough. And the Antichrist and all those demons will just disappear to dust and be gone. So the Antichrist, it has no power over Christ. So this is true. Well, what do we do? How should we respond? Not just in, in the future, but here and now. What do we do? Our, our final point is that, you know, we oppose the Antichrist by standing firm in Christ. So we oppose the Antichrist by standing firm in Christ. Not just there on that day for some believers, but for us now. And so this is the application Paul gives the Thessalonians. What should they do in light of the Antichrist that so they're worried about or thinking? How should they fight? They fight, well, by believing, standing in the gospel. Verse 13, we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord. Again, after all of this talk, what does Paul do? He starts giving thanks again. Talked about this last week in verse 1. All this talk about the Antichrist it just fills Paul with joy. He just wants to have a celebration and a party. Let's go around and say what we're thankful for. And he reminds them they are beloved by the Lord. He, he looks at them and is just smiling and saying, man, God, guys, lo God loves you. God loves you. I mean, one of the core parts and components of the gospel, it is the fact that God loves you. That He does. And, you know, I, I, when we think about the gospel, we should think about God's love for us. I don't think we just have to start off with how sinful and how bad we are. That's true, but that's, we can start where Paul does here. We just wonder and marvel at the unmerited, incredible, amazing love of God that He has for you. And he continues, because God chose you at the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. He reminds them of the gospel they should cling to in the first part of that phrase. God chose you. The gospel is not that we discovered God. The gospel is not that we invented a nice religion. The gospel is in Ephesians 1.4 that he chose us before the foundations of the world. Before he said that let there be light, he already saw all of your sins and all the stuff that was bad about you. And he looked at you with love and he said, I choose you. I want you to be a member of my family. Before the Antichrist came and Satan rebelled, God adopted us. And the phrase, the first fruits to be saved, your translation might just say from the beginning, means Jesus is the one who chooses us first. And God doesn't just choose us and saves us, He also sanctifies us through the sanctifying, sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Do you notice the difference between this and those, verse, those people in verse 12? The unbelievers don't believe the truth. But the Holy Spirit, He empowers believers to believe in the truth and to stand firm in it. It's a transformation that takes place because of Jesus, not because we're just so awesome. Verse 14, to this he called you through our gospel. God always calls people through hearing the gospel. Through the presentation of Christ, the gospel message of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Because God loved us and he chose us and he adopted us. And the call of the gospel is for us to repent of our sins. To turn from the Antichrist and to turn to worship the true Christ, Jesus. And to put our faith in Him and Him alone for salvation. And so we oppose the Antichrist by believing in the true Christ. And ultimately, anything else is just submission 
to Satan, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. See this in verse 14. It's not just that we obtain His glory for ourselves. It means we get to share in His glory. God doesn't just do this just to pump us up and make us feel great. He doesn't just save us so that we can go and be awesome. He does it to get all the glory that He deserves. So look at how glorious and amazing it is. And we as followers of Jesus, we get a front row seat to the glory of God. We get to see one day what Moses only got to glimpse at from hiding behind a rock. And not just a front row seat, but in some, some way we get to just participate in this glory. In verse 14, 15, it's our application, kind of the key verse here. It says, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions that were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Command here is to stand firm into the gospel, to be firmly committed to it, to hold on to it like an anchor, to stay committed to the gospel of Jesus, no matter what anyone else does, no matter what you might feel, no matter what you might want to do, to stand in it. And so when Paul says traditions here, that word might surprise you. What does he mean there? Well, he's talking about something serious. He's not just talking about, you know, tradition they had, like where they put their shoes when they walked into a church building. He's talking about something much bigger. Seems to be a reference, right, to the apostolic tradition. So hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. This is the teaching of the apostles. So traditions that they were taught. The, apo the apostolic tradition, it's kind of a catch-all way to refer to the gospel or to the core of what the apostles believed. Apostles were the first followers of Jesus. Or like Paul, they were men. They were all appointed by Christ, where God chose them and said, you will be my messenger. I'm going to tell you what I want people to hear about God and what I, what I have to say, and you will write Scripture. It's not just tradition. Okay, it's not just general church tradition. Well, we've always done things that way. It is apostolic tradition. It is the content of their teaching. It is what they said, not necessarily the way that they said it. it is they're, they're teaching about the gospel of Jesus and theology. That's what Paul is getting at. And so the apostolic tradition is delivered in two ways, either by our spoken word, by their preaching and their teaching, their discipleship, or by our letter. So maybe the things they heard when Paul was in their midst or the scripture that they wrote. Shows us they knew what they were writing. They weren't just writing random letters, and we kept them. They knew they were writing Scripture. They, didn't, they knew they weren't inventing a religion. They didn't think they were sharing their own ideas. They were passing on to the church what had been passed on to them from Christ. That is the tradition that we hold to. So hearing tradition, it might make you nervous, right? And you might, you know, think this means this is the church just decides what the Bible means. Well, that, that's not it. That's not what Paul is talking about. What he's saying is you don't get to decide what the Bible means. The apostles decided what it means. Jesus decides what it means. They set the standard, and we don't get to deviate from them. We don't get to decide, ah, you know, Jesus dying for our sins, don't really think that's it. No, 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 the apostles said he did. You've got to listen to them. You don't have the authority to decide that you know better than Paul or Peter or James or John. We don't get to decide we want to update the core of the faith and make it a little more relevant. We have to hold firm to the Scriptures. We hold firm and we have to believe what Jesus taught into the apostolic tradition. So the Antichrist is going to try and pull believers away from the apostles. He's going to try to pull people away from God's Word. And so we resist by rooting ourselves in the Scripture and in the teaching that Christians have believed since that day at Pentecost. In verse 16, he closes with a prayer and with a blessing. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ Himself and our God the Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. He reminds them again of the love of God. Reminds them again of the eternal comfort that comes from God that will last forever. He reminds them of grace. And he finishes verse 17. And by praying God would do more of it. So it would God comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. He's praying that God would comfort their hearts, that, you know, they, as they worry about the Antichrist and end times, they would be comforted and they would be obedient. They would stand firm. You know, I, I can't stress kind of how strange Paul's advice and encouragement is here, right? It, it's really unexpected. When you think about the end times or revelation or fighting the Antichrist, you might expect something different that he would say. Well, Armageddon's coming. Shouldn't we, you know, I don't know, 
make weapons or do something impressive. Maybe he would tell us how we could best resist and fight the Antichrist's plans and his legions and frustrate all the demonic armies. Or maybe Paul would give us better clues how we could identify the Antichrist. Here's where you should look out. Hey, anyone born from here, that that's definitely could be it. Could have prophesied those things, but he doesn't do any of that. He just encourages us. Tells us what we need to know, and it reminds us, believe the gospel. What's the best way to oppose the Antichrist? It's by believing the gospel. It's by standing firm in the faith of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Peter and Paul and the faith of the Thessalonians. You don't need a strategy. You don't even really need to know who the Antichrist is. But you do need to know who the Christ is. You do need to know Jesus. So how do we fight the Antichrist? No, we don't. Jesus does. We just stand firm in Jesus and in our ancient faith, and he'll take care of it. So this morning we, we talked about, you know, when the Antichrist is going to come. He's going to come before Jesus returns. Talked about the power he has. He has no power over Jesus, and we've talked about how to resist him. Well, we oppose him by just standing in Jesus. We've talked about him a, a lot this morning. You probably didn't get all your questions answered. Maybe you just have more. Maybe you were hoping for a different kind of sermon when you saw the title. But I truly believe that we know all that we need to know. We just need to stand in Christ and remember that Jesus will win with a word. Let's pray and I'll invite our worship team to come up. Lord, I, I, I praise you that you are the God who creates with words. That you speak and existence comes into being. And that you are also the God who can destroy our souls. You can bring us to nothing with a word, and one day you will wield that power against your enemies. Lord, I pray that we would be comforted. Lord, I pray that you would empower us to stand firm. Lord, that you would help us to not be deceived, that you would help us to not be confused or overwhelmed by all the things we don't understand or all the things people disagree about and we just can't make sense of it. Lord, when we read your word, when we be comforted, when we be comforted knowing that the Antichrist is not better than the true Christ, and that you are the God who is worth serving, worshiping, giving our lives to, and singing as loudly as we can about. And we pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we worship our Savior once more through song. The Lamb is holy. I'm going to invite you. You can come back on Wednesday night. We're going to be continuing my series on being human. This Wednesday, um, we're going to just study what the Bible has to say about homosexuality. We're just going to start in Genesis and go through um, a lot of different verses and just try and look at it and study it together. So if that's one of the things you were waiting for me to get to, We've got to that. That'll be this Wednesday. Um, I'm to hear this benediction from the end of Numbers. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Go in peace. <laughs>